Well, friends, we live in momentous times. We're living in a time period when the world is sitting on the edge of its seat. You can hardly open up the YouTube channel, read the news, and the world is watching Israel at this very moment. And the question is, is what the future of Israel is and what next? Well, today we're going to be specifically looking in detail at prophecies associated with Moses. So many other prophets made prophecies of concerning the future of Israel and the, and the destiny of Israel. But we're going to be specifically looking at the prophecies made by Moses. And of course, Moses is, as far as Israel is concerned, is the, is the man that brought them out of Egypt by the hand of God. And therefore, the, the picture depicted is that when the Red Sea was parted and they crossed over, leaving Egypt. But what about the situation today in the world and how are these prophecies relevant? Well, yesterday's news and today's news, the fear of World War III gets real. Total panic in Israel and the U.S. We're living in a momentous times when everybody realizes, Israel realizes, the United States realizes, everybody realizes that World War III, <laughs> and World War III has been what <laughs> is the thing that everybody in the world has feared coming upon the world. And you can see the alignments across the world starting at this time. And people are in panic, and they should be in panic. This is not a time to be sleeping or wandering around enjoying the weather. It should be a time to be wide awake. And, and of course, here in Seattle, when we get good weather, that's what we tend to do. We want to enjoy the weather. But most certainly, it's a time to consider the signs of the times. But what about Moses? Moses is not normally thought about as a prophet. But in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10, there rose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom Yahweh knew face to face. He's a prophet who had things directly revealed to him. And in Luke 24, when Christ, after his resurrection, is talking about things concerning himself, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets. So Moses is included as, as, the, as, the, the, as a name called out amongst the prophets, and all the prophets expounded unto them, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So Christ, on the road to Emmaus, he is, he is quoting from Moses and quoting from the prophets. And of course, in Numbers chapter 12, we are told that he's a prophet who, Christ, who God spoke to mouth to mouth. So he had direct revelation about the future. But most importantly, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, at verse 15, Yahweh thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. And in verse 18, I'll raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And of course, this is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. So not only is, is Moses portrayed as a, as a prophet, but the Lord Jesus Christ is a prophet and a prophet after the type of prophet that Moses was. So we're going to explore that in some detail. But one of the prophecies of Moses is in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 to 8, where it says in verse 6, For thou art a holy people unto Yahweh thy God. Yahweh thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. And why? Verse 8, But because Yahweh loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, that Yahweh brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of the bondman and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Not because in verse 7, because they were a better people or a greater people in more in number. This is in connection with the promises. And, and last week we spoke about some of those, last, rather not last week, last uh, public lecture in the uh, uh, prophecies and, 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 and promises made to Abraham. We spoke about those promises. So it's about promises. So they are their chosen people. They, the people of Israel are God's chosen people. There's no doubt about that. And that's one of the prophecies of Moses. And they're a witness to all people across the world. And we have 2,000 years of history <laughs> to, to look at from we're living in a period now uh, of, of, of history in connection with Israel. And the prophecies made by Moses span the history of, of Israel. So what prophecies are we going to focus on? In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 49 to 52, we have one of these prophecies. Now, this is in connection with cursings that God will bring upon the nation 
if they were not obedient to him and did not walk in his ways. And some of them are very specific. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 49, Yahweh shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the ends of the earth, as swift as an eagle that flyeth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. And, in, and here we can see, continuing in verse 52, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land. And that was fulfilled. In AD 70, Jerusalem, by men who had the symbol of an eagle, a nation, the Romans, and they spoke a language they could not understand, Latin, a language that was not discerned by the people of Israel, and, 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 and they destroyed Jerusalem. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ builds on these prophecies in what's called the Olivet Prophecy. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter, sorry, in Luke chapter 21, verses 20 to 24. And it speaks about Jerusalem being compassed with armies in verse 20. And then being led captive into all countries. And, and, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and led captive in verse 24. Into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So, Lord Jesus Christ, in the spirit of the prophecies of Moses, is making prophecies in connection with the destiny of Israel, the nation of Israel. And, and that came true. The, the, the Roman legions came upon Israel in, in keeping with Moses' prophecies and in connection, in keeping with the prophecies made by the Lord Jesus Christ in that same, in that same like unto Moses' prophecies. And we have the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Uh, an incredibly difficult time in the history of Israel. And ultimately led by the edge of the sword, Jerusalem fell by the edge of the sword, as, as predicted, as prophesied by Moses, and as prophesied by the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is shown in the Arch of Titus outside of Rome. The Titus recorded this uh, um, event. We can even see here the menorah and the people of Israel being taken captive. And this is something you can go and view in Rome to this day. But it, Moses doesn't stop there in his prophecies concerning Israel. In chapter 28, uh, of Luke, Luke, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 64 to 66, he says in verse 64, A Yahweh shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth even unto the other, and thou shalt serve other gods. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease. And in verse 66, And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And the history of Israel is filled with that. Just, just the time of the Spanish Inquisition of 1492, in that time period, the Jews were expelled and persecuted in Spain. And if you go and look at the Jewish pogroms in Russia, and of course in, in, in Germany, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, the persecution of the Jews and throughout the world has continued. So that's a direct fulfillment of Bible prophecies made by Moses. And what we're learning is that these prophecies, we can compare, and, and Christ confirmed those prophecies, and we can see them being fulfilled. However, in, in, in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3, like all the other prophets, we'll be looking at uh, uh, prophets who, who then build on what, what Christ and, and what, what Moses prophesied and what the Lord Jesus Christ prophesied. We can look to other uh, prophets uh, of the Scripture. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3, it says, For the, Lord, the days come, saith the Yahweh, that I'll bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith Yahweh, and I'll cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Well, it's very clear. And this is the, uh, remember that huh, the nation of Israel was in, was in, uh, in exile and in, in, in spread across into all of Europe and across the world and, and for thousands of years. Over, um, uh, well over a thousand years subsequent to AD 70. Now, Jeremiah makes predictions as to how they were going to be restored back to the land. So, Jeremiah 16, verse 16, Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith Yahweh, and they shall fish them. And after that, after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them. So what's this about fishers and hunting? Remember that the context is them being regathered. So how are they going to be fished and hunted to be, bring them? Now, fishing is a very positive thing in the sense of being drawn in, and hunting is the opposite. Hunting is the idea that they'll be hunted out of, it, out of, out of, just out of where they were and brought back into the land by that method. And we're just going to focus on three of the fishers, Theodore Herzl, Chaim Weizmann, and Baron Rothschild. 
Theodore Herzl was a man who, who was uh, focused on establishment of a Jewish state. Uh, he lived from 1860 to 1904. He was an Austrian-Hungarian journalist, uh, Jewish journalist. And he promoted and the organization of a Jewish immigration to Palestine in the effort to form a Jewish state. And see the dates here, 1904? The Jewish state wasn't established in 1904. But he, the, the, what's called the Basel Conference in 1897 was the conference where the Jewish state idea of a Jewish state and Zionism became an idea. So... In 1897, the Zionist Conference, Theodore Herzl says, at Basel, I founded the Jewish state. But of course, this didn't bring about the Jewish state. This was the concept of a, of a Jewish state. Now you might say, well, was God's hand involved here? Absolutely. God's hand was involved in steering history and steering people to achieve a goal. One other key individual is a man called Theodore Herzl, uh, sorry, sorry, Chaim Weizmann. Chaim Weizmann was a Jewish-born bio, was a Russian-born biochemist, Zionist leader, and Israeli statesman. And he, in, during the First World War, he had he developed key technology using uh, to allow them to build more efficient explosives in in England at the time, and that put him in very good standing with the uh, British government. And he petitioned, and petitioned multiple times, uh, to to form the state of Israel. In 1848, he met with another man, and this man is, uh, sorry, in 1917, he meets with a man called Arthur James Balfour. But Arthur James Balfour is, a, is known for one important thing. He issued the Balfour Declaration of 1917 and on behalf of the cabinet to establish a home for the Jewish people in Palestine. So the influence of, of Chaim Weizmann in, in, in 1917, over t Lord Balfour helped to get what's called the Balfour Declaration written. And the Balfour Declaration, if you go and look in, in any website, or an historical website, is key to the formation of the nation of Israel. And it says, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. And that's on the 2nd of November, 1917. Now, in parallel with this, what is going on, uh, General Allenby, who was leading the, the British forces, uh, takes Jerusalem from the Turks in 1917. In fact, just a few weeks later, in the 11th of December 1917, General Allenby enters Jerusalem on foot and takes Jerusalem back from the Turks. So we have two things going on here. We have God working in different ways to, to establish the state and the third person we wanted to talk about on the, uh, the heading of fishes is Baron Rothschild. He was a, a wealthy uh, French Jewish banker who lived in England, and he, he, he helped to develop the financial support required to build the Jewish homeland. And they put millions of dollars in millions of dollars, of course, much more than millions of dollars in our modern currency, into developing a, 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 the Jewish homeland. In, in 1924, he established the Jewish Colonization Association, and they, 125,000 acres of land were purchased and businesses established. So, Baron Rothschild became key to the development of the Jewish and the Zionist state. Now, at this point, the work of the fishers, this is God's hand in fishing them out, bringing them out of the nations into, into, in, back into the land, but they didn't respond. So very, very few Jewish people, by, by contrast to those that live in, in the United States or in Europe, very few took the opportunity of return. And it wasn't even a, a proper state. What happened next? In come the hunters. Remember, fishers and hunters. Adolf Hitler. And, and hunting was the only way to describe it. How could you possibly push people who had been living in dispersal many of them very successfully. How could you possibly push them back into the land? And in Europe, the Jews were rounded up by Hitler and, up, and, and transported into concentration camps. Women and children were sent into death camps. Six million Jews rounded up for execution. Massive ghettos, which were established, were then cleared 
and people put into into the concentration camps and ultimately into death camps, uh, for example, at Auschwitz. This is all history. But it, what was this history leading to? This, these terrible actions by the hunters pushing these nation, the nation of Israel, pushing the people of Israel. Those same survivors from the death camps we travel back in 1947, many of and the, one of the ships, refugee ships, was called the Exodus. So hence we're getting, hence the link between Moses and Moses' predictions that they would be dispersed and then be brought back again. This was another Exodus, the beginning of a kind of an Exodus. The work of the fishers and the hunters, um, uh, positive and negative, the work of the fishers being drawing them out, like like whites, uh, like like the work of, of uh, of, of, of Balfour and Weizmann and, and uh, Lord Rothschild and the opposite, the work of the hunters. And out of that comes the State of Israel in 1948. For the first time since AD 70, the nation was back in the land as a nation, a state. A state of Israel is born, the headline news. So part of the prophecies we've been talking about, the prophecies of Moses and national Israel, God would not despise completely abandoned them. It had taken thousands of years since the time period of, of, of AD 70 and their dispersal to the time of regathering. And in 1967, the 67 uh, the, 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 uh, war, Jerusalem is recaptured. And for the first time in 1900 years, the Jews were now in control of the ancient city of Jerusalem. And that fulfills, remember that the Lord Jesus Christ said, They shall fall by the edge of the sword and led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So right away, we can see that the Gentiles are no longer treading Jerusalem. And from 1967 onwards, that time of what we call the Gentiles is coming to an end. And Israel, and this is, this is from the 40-year uh, memorial of Israel, the Time magazine, and it says, 40 years of achievement and 40 years of conflict. Israel is always in the news. And let's focus on that. We don't have to look very far. Everybody remembers the 7th of October, 2023. On the highest, it's called Shemini Atzaret, the eighth day of assembly, the highest holy day of the Jewish calendar. It is the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the last day, a separate day, of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is also a normal Sabbath, so a double Sabbath, at 6.30 a.m. in the morning, Hamas sends multiple rockets and, 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 uh, into, into, into Israel and into Jerusalem in that great day of assembly. And the whole world changed. The whole world changed in a moment. Up until then, the world had been focusing on what ha was happening in Ukraine and Russia, and the world's attention was immediately drawn to this great day. Something is happening, this great day, something to wake up the world. And of course, Israel retaliated. We have the news. We know what happens. Israel retaliates immediately in, in, in various ways, rains rockets down upon, upon Gaza, and, and hundreds are killed in 24 hours, an immediate and, 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 and very strong response. And here we have the tanks. This is uh, uh, one of the kibbutz right outside of, of, um, of, of the Gaza. The tanks went in and, and ground forces and, and constantly Israel's at war. Now we're sitting in April uh, 2024 and Israel's at war. But it, it's a restrained war so far. It was a restrained war until... Damascus is attacked. Now, we don't know who attacked the Iranian consulate in, uh, in, in Syria, in Damascus. We don't know. But you can see with Al Jazeera, <laughs> all of the uh, Islamic world are absolutely sure it's Israel that behind the attack. And Israel, to my knowledge, has not denied it. And what happened then, that was 10 days ago, <laughs> a day ago, a 24 hour, uh, uh, Iran gives 24 hours until attack on Israel, literally saying, Within 24 hours, we're going to attack you. We're going to fire rockets at you. So you can imagine what that means to the whole world. And they, they lived up to what they said. They didn't just launch... Uh, uh, <laughs> the whole war now became U.S. and Israel on high alert amid fears of an Iran attack. 
the world is sitting on the edge of its table, edge of its seat, watching this. We're living in a, the world is focused on Israel. What's going to happen with Israel next? What next? Are we going to see Israel destroyed? Are we going to see a nuclear war? What's going to happen next? And you can see, here's Iran, 2,000 kilometers away, they fired rockets. And they were over during the night last night and, and then early this morning and during the course of yesterday, all the nations between were trying to help even the Jordanians and the United States flying uh, aircraft and, and uh, interceptors. Uh, uh, were trying to intercept these, these uh, drones and missiles as they headed towards Israel. And the majority of them have been intercepted. You'll hear the news as the day develops. And, of course, the United States has issued travel warnings, as they always do. Family members are restricting travel within Israel where they think the rockets would land, or potentially land, and they can see the, the actual uh, fallout of the war. And, of course, Hezbollah, is, it, which has many more rockets up in, the, up in Syria, they are about to start firing rockets in, in Lebanon, firing rockets into Israel as well. And they have a huge cache of those as well. So within the next couple of days, we, would, we could see this whole thing escalate or potentially there could be a delay. So what's all about? The fear of World War III gets real. Total panic, as we saw with this slide. This is, not, this is taken not from, I didn't make the slide, this is taken straight from a newscaster. And another party enters. Putin warns Biden not to interfere. Now, that's really important. Now we have, yeah, we can see he has Biden with his arm around, around um, the Israeli president, and, and, and we, have, <laughs> we have Putin hand in hand with the Iranian. So, what can we say? Armageddon or not? Now, we know from Revelation 16, verses 14 to 16, it says, for the spirits of demons working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And you will gather them together unto a place called the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And who's been gathered? Well, we go to other prophecies to know that it's the image will stand. That image consists of all these nations. We, uh, yeah, in other words, Russia, European nations, the nations of silver and gold, which correspond to the Nebuchadnezzar's image, which include Iran. You can see Iran over here under the, uh, the, the Persian time period, the silver, and of course the iron, speaking of European nations. And what alignment do we expect? That's what I'm taking from Daniel chapter 2. And this is part of what we'll be doing as a series. We'll be looking into these prophecies in some detail. We're just getting a big picture. What we expect at the time of the end, when at the time of Armageddon, is these blue nations... These countries in this blue region, Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and, and, and with the United States and Britain and other nations under the blue color here, associate the southern portion here, and then nations coming from the north, including most certainly Russia, and including uh, nations from, the, from Africa, coming into, into Israel to battle. And those are, how do we get those names? From Ezekiel chapter 38. And what happens at that point is, all nations will be gathered down into a valley called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That's a valley outside of Jerusalem. And God will plead with them for his people, we're told in Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. This is just to get the big picture. So we are seeing that happening right now. All the nations, all the alignments that we expected from Bible prophecy, which again is not the main subject for this morning, this afternoon, uh, our main subject is to understand the prophecies of Moses. But by these other prophets, we can set the stage for what some additional prophecies of Moses that are highly relevant to Israel. But I will gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will plead for them for my people. And that's what Moses talked about. My people is the people of Israel, and for my heritage, Israel. So, in Joel chapter 3, we're told, Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, or threshing, for the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of threshing. And of course, that all matches up with the word Armageddon. God will thresh the nations. Threshing of judgment. God will judge the nations. So, how does this all fit in with respect to Moses' prophecies? 
In Deuteronomy chapter 28, we've seen the cursings. We've seen what happens if they are disobedient. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 to 2, it says, And it shall come to pass, if thou hearken diligently unto the voice of Yahweh thy God, to observe and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, and Yahweh thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of of Yahweh thy God. So they're great blessings if they hearken unto the voice. And if they hearken unto the voice and do them diligently, then they'll be set above all nations of the earth. That's never happened. In two ways. They haven't hearkened, number one, and number two, they haven't been set above all nations on the earth. Quite the contrary. Right now they are a highly controversial situation where the whole world is sitting on the edge of their seat expecting a world war. World War III. That's not my words. That's the words of the newscasters this morning. There's not a single newscaster on the news this morning I could see that wasn't sitting saying, and now what? Is it Armageddon? Is this the end? And of course, their understanding of Armageddon could be a, a nuclear war. Our understanding of Armageddon, it's a judgment of God upon the nations, as we saw from looking at a few Bible prophecies. So, here's the important thing. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 to 18. And Yahweh thy God shall raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, as we saw earlier on, like unto me, unto him shall you hearken. And in verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto me, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I have commanded them. Now, <laughs> in Christ's ministry, he was rejected. He was rejected all the way through to the crucifixion by the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel was destroyed in AD 70. They didn't hearken to them. And they didn't get the blessings of Moses either. And we know that because here in Acts chapter 3, in that time period, it says, Acts chapter 3 verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. So Christ is in heaven right now, and he must be received until those prophecies can come true. For Moses truly said unto thy fa the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. This is talking of the future when Christ returns from heaven. Like unto him, like unto me, like Moses, he will bring another kind of exodus. Him shall you hear, and all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. So there's a future time when Israel has to respond and hear this prophet like unto Moses. And again in Acts 7 verse 37, this is that Moses was said unto the children of Israel, this is Stephen making his speech to the Sanhedrin, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. So, to get the blessings we saw from Deuteronomy 28 that Moses was talking about, a prophet had to be raised who they would hear. And Israel, has, Christ has never been heard. He's never been heard by the nation of Israel. It requires a future fulfillment. And that's what we're talking about. Ezekiel 37, verse 21, adds information that is very helpful. Then saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen. We've seen that. That's become, that's fulfilled prophecy. With, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. I'll make them one nation. You've seen that fulfilled. In the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. That's never been fulfilled. There, a king is required. A king must return. I'll be waiting for Christ's return. Thy kingdom come, that thy will be done, as in the Lord's prayer. That prophet like unto Moses is required for them to hear. And to add further information from the New Testament, Romans chapter 11, verses 1 to 2. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I, this is Paul's writings, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. In Romans 11, verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved. As written, there shall come 
out of Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So it's important. For Israel to be saved, a deliverer has to come, and he has to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So that's important. God's salvation offered to Israel requires a deliverer. It requires somebody to be coming like unto Moses, as we saw from the Acts. That's in the future. And God has not cast away his people because of the promises that he has made. So a deliverer is required. And that, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ who must return. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 1, it says, These are the words of the covenant which Yahweh commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb, or in Sinai. So this is a second covenant made by God as they were about to enter the land of Israel at the end of the Exodus. It's a covenant, of a, a covenant between God and the nation of Israel in connection, and this, is, of course, is a prophecy of Moses. Hence the toy. The prophecy of Moses is a covenant to the fathers. It says in verse 12, Thou shouldest enter into a covenant with Yahweh thy God, into an oath which Yahweh thy God maketh with thee this day, and he, that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, that he may be unto thee a God, and he said unto thee, as he, is, as, he, as he has said unto thee, and as he has sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, neither will you only do it, neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath. So it's a co an oath and a covenant is made according to the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as he has sworn a covenant and oath is made with the nation of Israel. But Israel will not be abandoned. But how? Currently, <laughs> the situation with Israel is precarious. We know from we saw in those prophecies about Armageddon that all the nations will come upon Israel and Israel will be in incredibly dangerous circumstances, literally surrounded by armies as they were in the time of, uh, as they were surrounded by the Roman armies. They have to respond to something. So here's the last uh, Bible prophecy by Moses we're going to consider, and probably the most important of all the prophecies so maybe if you have your Bibles, you can have a look at it inside the, and mark up this particular section or make a, 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 a note for yourself to have a careful look at this prophecy. It's a little known prophecy, but a very important prophecy. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 1 to 3. And this is the blessing with, with Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before he's dead. So this is, he's dying. Moses dies before they can enter the land. He dies here at the end of Deuteronomy as they are about to cross the Jordan under Joshua and enter the land. What's he say? And he said, Yahweh came from Zion, from Sinai, and rose up from Seir. Unto them he shined forth upon Paran. He, made, he came with 10,000 of his saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet and everyone shall receive of my words. So Moses is talking about a future time when Israel will be delivered by the hand of saints. Now, thousands, 10,000 of these saints. Now, who are these 10,000 saints that are coming to deliver the future Israel? This is a prophetic statement. And how does it fit in with this big picture of Armageddon, which we are, focused, we are facing face to face right now? So we're told in Psalm 68 verse 7, uh, again, if this is Psalm 68, is another uh, uh, prophecy in the Psalms based upon the same prophecy made by Moses in Deuteronomy. And in verse 7 it says, O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness, so it's, this is a psalm saying, what happened there? The nation of Israel marched through the wilderness, and this is a prophecy, as we see, in Psalm 68, verses 17 to 18, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, and hast received gifts of men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that Yahweh, God, might be dwell among them. So this is talking about a future time when there's going to be delivery coming out of Sinai and ultimately coming to Jerusalem to deliver the people of Israel. Now, who, is the, who are these people? This is not the subject matter. I'll just give you an overview. These 10,000 saints, thousands of saints, are those who are resurrected when Christ returns, taken to Sinai and resurrected, and given immortality and judged. 
and then become the saints of the future judgment. That's who's been spoken about here. And as the Lord Jesus Christ ascended from the Mount of Olives, these same saints will come with Christ and stand upon the Mount of Olives with Christ. And we'll look in some Bible verses to prove that. But here's the importance. In Second Peter verses 1, verse 4, it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and pro uh, precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we get given uh, in, the the in the purpose of God those who are judged righteous and, and judged uh, worthy to receive immortality, will be given immortality and be partakers of the divine nature and be as the angels to judge this world. So let's bring all these prophecies together as one subject matter now. In, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 1 to 3, we go back to those verses now and have a look at what's been spoken about. So reading carefully now, it says, And this is the blessing with Moses, the span of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, Yahweh came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousand of his saints. For his right hand went for, from his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loves the people. All his saints are in thy hand, and they shall, and, and, they, and they sat down at thy feet, and everyone shall receive thy words. So remember that in Deuteronomy we told, if they receive the words, their great blessings will come. So if you keep your one finger in your Bibles there, go to Zechariah chapter 14, verses 3 to 5, you'll find the context. So Zechariah 14 is where we're going to focus to understand the fulfillment of this particular Bible prophecy and how important it is. So Zechariah 14, just to get the context, in Zechariah 14, verse 1, it says, Behold, the day of Yahweh cometh, and, the, and thy spoils shall be divided amidst of thee. Verse 2 of Zechariah 14, I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the highest is rifle. So you can see we've seen that from looking at Joel. We've seen that from looking at, at the, uh, the uh, other Bible prophecies associated, Micah, uh, uh, Ezekiel 38, that this is this, this here, that's Jerusalem. This is looking from, from the Mount of Olives. This picture is taken from the Mount of Olives. And this is a situation where Israel will be literally at the mercy of the nations that have come against them. We've seen that that will include Russia, Iran, and many other nations coming against Israel as a nation. But then deliverance comes. See, all nations in verse 10. And then verse 3. Then shall Yahweh go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Verse 3. And his feet shall stand on that day upon the Mount of Olives. This is exactly where this picture is taken from. Which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a great valley, and half the mountain shall be moved to the north, and half of it to the south. Very graphic language. And here's the important point. Remember we talked about Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 1 to 3, being so important. And ye shall, and, and it says in, at the second half, Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled before the great earthquake, before the earthquake, verse 5, of the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And Yahweh thy God shall come, and all the saints with thee. So this is Christ and the saints. And you can see if you compare Zechariah 14, you compare that to Deuteronomy chapter 33, this prophecy of Moses is absolutely pivotal. So what, what have you learned so far? The nation of Israel will fight, and they're going to continue to fight as they are fighting now. And ultimately, all nations will be gathered to a battle called Armageddon. The delivery from that, how will they come to know God? How will they come to hear this uh, Christ as the uh, prophet like Moses? Only by delivery. It says that very clearly. And you can see that if you read further, um, in Zechariah chapter 14, it says, just speaking from uh, verse 16, for example, in Zechariah 14, it shall come to pass that everyone that's left of all the nations which came, out Jerusalem, came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. Verse 16. So we can see that the nations who came against Jerusalem will be going to worship. So that fulfills the, the prophecies of Moses that spoke to both about Israel being lifted up above all nations. And what's the whole point about this? In verse 20, it says, In that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto Yahweh, and in the pots of Yahweh's house shall be like the bowls 
before the altar. So holiness unto Yahweh is the whole point in Zechariah 14 verse 20. So this gives us a big picture. At this point, we are told in Zechariah chapter 12, we won't have to look into that in any detail, but we're told that the nation itself will recognize the Lord Jesus Christ and hear him. And this becomes the beginning of the delivery of the nation. So what should we be doing? So first, the challenge in seeing this, we've seen God's fulfilled Bible prophecies. We've seen that these are not small-time news prophecies that are hard to interpret. They are very clear. We've seen how that the Israel being persecuted and dispersed throughout the nations is fulfilled Bible prophecy. We see that the current events are fulfilled Bible prophecy. But what must be what our response? We must first believe that God exists. God is in control of these nations. We need to understand the gospel of Christ. We have to respond to that gospel and those great promises and, and accept Christ in baptism. And we must love his appearing. We must look forward. When we see these signs around us, we must be looking forward to his appearing. And, and what do we do else? We, in, Mark, in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 16, go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's our response to this, to be ready. Believe, baptized, love is appearing. And, and what we've learned is that throughout history, Bible prophecy is a mold into which history is poured, not vice versa. We don't take Bible prophecy and then try and make history match up. History itself fulfills Bible prophecy. And we've seen that uh, through the predictions made by the Lord Jesus, prophecies made by the Lord Jesus Christ and by Moses and all the prophets being fulfilled. So, I encourage each one of you, every one of you in the audience and those across the internet to, to consider this and respond. The signs are extremely clear. The prophecies of Moses are coming true before our eyes, of course, together with all the other prophets. And the, and the promises made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are being fulfilled. And the nation of Israel is a great witness to that, a great witness to how God will turn their hearts through delivering them in the same way as our hearts can be turned through the deliverance that is in Christ. Amen. Thank you.